<laughs> like I, I reposted the post they put up where they included Salt City. Yeah. Who they, you know, Salt City's a great partner of mine. Oh, and, cool. And um, I forget who the other um, company was, but I reposted that. Like, yeah. come on, people. Right. Like. Yeah. I'm amazed at the, I on, I've only seen um, really strong competition from people in the industry from like one or two places. And whether it's the brewers, whether it's coffee roasters, um, even most restaurants downtown in Armory where they're all packed in right there next to each other competing yeah. for the same customer, yeah. they're all uh, working together. They all support yeah. one another. Um, even behind closed doors, I don't hear them talk about, Pat, about their competition. Yeah. And that's it's, amazing. It's it's so hugely important. Yeah. For sure. I was... Um, speaking at my son's high school the other day um, for his entrepreneurship class and one of the like w I, I forget what the exact question was but it had to deal with competition and I said mm. you know you none of you should fear competition hmm. you know competition is always going to be there what you should try to do is embrace it and like meet them know them hmm. befriend them yeah it's not it's not going to serve anybody yeah. to have an adversarial relationship so right yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Especially in business, especially in Syracuse. In, yeah, yeah. In a small market like ours. Great. For sure. Yeah. I was talking with John Timmerman about that and uh great guy. Yeah. He did the he did the last redesign on my website. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. It's um that's cool cuz I like the website. I was I was on the website oh, last night. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And um uh so that's cool to know that because, you know, sometimes you're going through like good websites and I'm like, I wonder who did this. Yeah. Or I talked to yeah, John. Good, yeah, good monster. Yeah. And I can get into that story, how much money I wasted. But Oh, really? Not on him, but on Yeah, him. no, no, no. Yeah, yeah so. on others. Yeah. That is a... Well, all right. So, um, and you work for uh, Mortgage Bank? I used to. Okay. Um, are we recording now or no? Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> uh, so, I used to. I worked for my family's mortgage company um, for 15 years. Okay. And if anybody's looking for a mortgage, Common yeah. Fund Mortgage, best place in town. But, okay. Um, I, uh, after 15 years, um, I, I just, I needed a change. Yeah. Um, so I recently just, um, switched completely out of mortgages and now I work for a company called spin car oh, in okay. downtown Syracuse. So yeah. they're a digital merchandising company for the automotive industry. Oh wow. So if there's any auto dealers out there, yeah. give us a call. <laughs> um, so, you know, going into technology from being in mortgages and now selling, yeah. Um, software basically yeah. uh, versus mortgages has been a big change. So, um, yeah, that that just I've just finished my fifth week there. So wow, congratulations! Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. How uh, was it? So just kind of done with the mortgage industry. I just you know the last few years I've just needed. I wouldn't really say I've been restless necessarily, but okay. I've just needed to kind of broaden my mind a little bit. So about. Uh, three years ago, I started a podcast, yeah. sort of on a whim. Okay. And the the reason was I love listening to podcasts. Yeah. And I, but the majority of the podcasts that we listen to are of people, you know, big people around the country or the world. Mm -hmm. But we had so many people here. I mean, just like what you're doing, mm -hmm. which I love. <laughs> we have so many people in our area that are doing amazing things, whether mm -hmm. it be in fitness or food or clothing, what, whatever it is. Yeah. And there's a lot of stories to be told that I just don't think people have the opportunity to tell. Yeah. So, so coupled with that, I wanted to also be around inspirational people who were really chasing their dreams or, you know, following a passion, following a calling. That's cool. And I figured the podcast would be sort of the best way to do it. So I got through 10 yeah. episodes and then just got, I ran out of guests and got <laughs> too busy and, um, I didn't run out. I just, um, didn't have the connections to get to certain people. So gotcha. it's been tabled for now. But, yeah. Um, so, I, so I started doing that, and that was a few years ago. And then I think as I met these people mm -hmm. who were, you know, some were social media influencers, um, some opened up clothing stores. Some, mm -hmm. It really just got my mind going, which was the point mm -hmm. of it to say, could you find something that could be your own? Mm-hmm. And can you actually do it? Yeah. Um, so yeah. I threw another podcast, and I don't recall which one it was, but the the guest on the podcast said, 
something along the lines of if you come up with an idea and it hasn't stuck with you, like you don't feel the same passion after three weeks, I think it was, then it probably isn't a good idea for you to be following. Hmm. So I came up with a handful of ideas over the course of time. And sure enough, that happened. Some of them were just really bad <laughs> ideas. Like initially, I was like, oh, this would be amazing. Um, like a CrossFit apparel-centered store. And I was like, no. That, that's just not good. No. Uh, so, so through that, it just started to really get my mind sort of spinning. Mm. Um, mm. And coupled with the, around that time, uh, my wife used to own yoga studios, okay. Oh Yoga. She oh. just recently sold them. So, oh, okay. yeah. Um, so she started those. My friends I'm going to have coffee with afterwards go to Oh Yoga. Oh, great. Yeah, Zach yeah. and Rachel from Kubal. Oh, yeah, yeah awesome. Yeah. And I, I teach there still. Oh, okay. Um, so, um, yeah. so, yeah, so we still are very tied in there. But So we were leading a yoga retreat in Costa Rica hmm. down on the Osa Peninsula. And this is sort of the second step in the story of what led me to the chocolate. Yeah. But... And while we were down there, there were, I think it was the last day, there was this young couple who came on to the retreat center, hmm. and they brought their chocolate that they make from locally grown cacao oh, from cool. the Osa Peninsula. So oh, they wow. gather cacao from farmers down hmm. there, hmm. and then um, they have their own little shop. Yeah. So hmm. we tried the chocolate, and it was really good. And this was sort of my second um, interaction with bean to bar down there. They call it tree to bar cause it's coming right off of the tree, but mm. bean to bar chocolate, um, mm. which is a whole different experience than sort of what we're used to doing. Yeah. So, um, so we had the chocolate, we bought a bunch of bars, brought them back. We got back. My wife left shortly thereafter to go to New York for a uh, training with her teacher there for yoga. And while she was gone, it, I was out driving around mm. running some errands and it just popped into my mind where I said, well, if, these people in Costa Rica can make it. Mm -hmm. And Costa Rica is our favorite place or one of our favorite places oh, really? on the planet to visit. <laughs> so I hold it in very high regard. But it's doesn't have the infrastructure that we have, doesn't have yeah. the ability to get goods. and pro So I said, if, if they can do it down there, why can't I figure it out here? Mm -hmm. And I love sweets. Right. I love chocolate. So I, I messaged my wife. I said, I think I know what I want to do with my life. <laughs> and kind of I always equate it to sort of the – like the parent talking to the child when the kid says, oh, I want to do X, Y, and Z. And the parent just sort of pats him on the head and says, you know, sure, Tommy, go ahead. Yeah. That was sort of what I got. It was like, wow. all right, we'll play along. Yeah. Supportive. I'm supportive. We'll play along. <laughs> Let's see where this goes. So, so she said, but we know nothing about making chocolate. Right. And I'm just like, okay, fair enough. We don't. <laughs> so she said, can you find a, a, a course or some sort of training that you can do? Mm. And I think, fingers crossed, she was like, this might be the end of it. But nope, sure enough, within about an hour, I found um, e -Cole, a school called E. Cole Chocolat. And they're a Vancouver-based company. Okay. Um, they do the majority of their stuff online. Okay. And then they also offer trainings through other – it's mostly chocolatier stuff, not okay. chocolate making. Yeah. But it just so happened that two weeks after, there was a bean-to-bar hmm. um, course starting. Okay. And I was like, wow, this is sort of ironic. Hmm. So signed up for the bean to bar course and, um, that took about two or two and a half months. It wow. was writing some papers, but the majority of it was reading mm. and oh, did you have to go out there for that or was this no, online? I could do it all right in my kitchen, That's nice. which was great. Yeah. But then it was also a lot of it was tasting mm. chocolate. Okay. So basically each week or every other week we had to. And a lot of people roll their eyes like, oh, poor you. <laughs> but we had to taste chocolate. Of So the first tasting, for instance, we did was we had to find a high quality like bean to bar chocolate bar. Okay. We had to find a bar of Baker's chocolate. Hmm. We had to find like a, what is considered a high end, like a Lint or a okay. Godiva or a Toblerone, hmm. you know, dark chocolate. These were all yeah. dark. And then the last one was we had to find those couverture wafers. So hmm. those little... Yeah things that I used to shove in my mouth as a child. <laughs> um, so that first tasting was so unbelievably hmm. eye opening hmm. to m my perception of chocolate. And this is coming after the tastings, like a week after the education. No, it was the first tasting. So it was like uh. the first assignment. Oh, wow. And then I had to write hmm. like the flavor profiles and my experience. And so hmm. when you go from tasting 
the bean to bar chocolate to then any of the others. The mm-hmm. baker's chocolate, oddly enough, was probably the next best. Okay. Oh, really? Yes. Oddly enough, because you mm-hmm. got to the, you could immediately taste the added oils mm-hmm. and things that were even in like the, we, I picked up a Toblerone bar. So even in that, okay, yeah. Uh, but then you get to the, the couverture wafers that you buy in bulk at any grocery yeah. store. And it was just like you were eating vegetable oil. And we all just looked at each other (laughs) and we almost didn't even know what to say. Wow. So then the tastings went on. I had to, then it was tasting. um, One of them was tasting bars from the different regions of the world. So cacao Mm. only grows 20 degrees north or south of the equator. Yeah. So the only place successfully growing cacao right now in the U.S. is Hawaii. Yeah. And I know you were just there. Oh, yeah. Uh, So (laughs) the the Dole Plantation had, uh, I think they have. Whatever they there was definitely like you could see trees with the like cacao pods yeah. on it yeah yeah and there's some there's one large maker who's doing great work out there hmm. um, so we so we had to try from like Mexico Latin America hmm. South America um, the s- sort of South Pacific area uh, I think we got a bar from India Africa um, and then hmm. then you and then your mind just starts to go how different it is even with high quality bars buying from all these makers Mm -hmm. that are making in, you know, small ish batches. Yeah. Just how different it tastes. And even when you're tasting the same cacao. So like my Madagascar bar, I buy the beans from fruition, fruition chocolate down in the Hudson Valley Mm. and Brian and Dahlia Graham are, they're doing amazing Mm. work and their bars are, in my opinion, some of the best that you can buy. Really? But like my Madagascar bar tastes drastically different from their Madagascar bar Hmm. for multiple reasons. But, um, you know, so you really just start to experience this whole world of flavors that Hmm. you don't ever really know existed because we just assume dark chocolate, especially is just dry and chalky and it might, one might be a little creamer than the other, but generally speaking, it all tastes the same. Yeah. Can you get, high quality chocolate in the grocery store? Well, so there's in my personal opinion, yeah. not around here. Okay. Um, even the, even some of the places that are carrying some of the more expensive bars, they're, they're oftentimes mass produced. Yeah. Um, that's what I'm thinking is like, uh, you know, I mean, God knows what it looks like right now, but Wegmans, they have, you know, there, there's all yeah. the fancy wrapper, you know, and so you see that and you might pay an extra dollar or two for, a bar of chocolate and think that it's something great. But at the end of the day, it is mass produced. Yeah, it doesn't compare. So if you were to seek out a bean to bar maker Mm -hmm. and there are some large scale makers that do sort of pass themselves off as a bean to bar maker. Mm -hmm. And if you start to taste like high quality chocolate from different makers, you'll very quickly pick up on the ones that are really doing the work and the ones that are not. So sort of the way it was put to me was, the current step in your chocolate making process is only as good as the part that came before. Okay. So if at origin Hmm. they do a bad job growing it, no matter how good the fermentation or my roasting or my making is, I'm not going to make up for poor growing. Yeah. If if the fermentation gets messed up, then the, I can't fix it. If I mess up the roast, Mm -hmm. no matter what I do when I'm grinding the chocolate down and liquefying it and whatever, I can't make up for a bad roast. You're right. So, um, a lot of times in, when people are buying the chocolate f- from the larger scale makers, even though it might be a bar that you're paying a little extra for, usually where it's sort of gone wrong is in the roasting phase because they just roast everything the same. Okay. It might even be lesser grade cacao. So just mass grown cacao. Hmm. And, but the roasting part, just like with coffee, yeah. is really where a lot of that yeah. and the fermentation at origin are the two places where the flavor development of the beans is really brought out. Okay. Um, and it, so, yeah. I was just going to say, like, I think of uh, coffee, for example. Yes. You know, you find some amazing coffees at these small uh, farms that they don't make enough to don't produce enough to sell to the mass federation. Yeah. And so you wind up finding this amazing coffee. Is that kind of the same thing when it comes to cacao? Yeah, it is very similar. So you sort of have to separate West Africa from the rest of the cacao growing part of the world. Okay. And that's starting to change. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. Um, But historically in West Africa, it's been mass produced Hmm. run by basically the farmers have been 
more or less run by the governments, mm. which are then sort of run by the big chocolate yeah. conglomerates. All right. So the farmers don't, I don't want to say that they, they don't have the ability to do better work, but they don't have the money to do better work. Gotcha. So the, the bean to bar industry was started by, you know, started in a few different directions. I know that ask the guy that owns Askinosi chocolate, he's probably one of the more prominent ones mm. in the trend that has happened in the bean to bar industry now. So okay. about 10 or so years ago, people started going into, especially the Latin American countries mm. and the, some, some of the Caribbean areas and meeting with farmers, helping them learn better processes because they were just basically letting their cacao crop go, like just leaving it because it just mm. wasn't a money making thing for them. Gotcha. A lot of these farmers are small. They're on 10 hectare farms. So, mm. you know, that's, I don't know, that hectare to, I think it's double acreage. So figure it's maybe 20 acres, wow. but they're having to still grow lots of other crops in order to not only feed their family, but also make money. Yeah. So people started going into these countries and working with the farmers to not only learn better farming practices, more sustainable farming practices, but also start, start to centralize their fermentation. Mm -hmm. So, okay. um, you know, similar to like fermenting an alcohol, basically mm -hmm. what happens is they put the, all of the cacao beans into bins, cover them either with burlap or palm leaves. And mm -hmm. then they let them sit in there for a couple of days where it heats up, temperature grows, alcohol starts to form. And then from there they pour them into a next bin and it kind of goes its way down the line over the course of four to six days. Does that have, does that happen at where they're growing it? Yes. Okay. Yep. So just like what you were saying with the coffee growers where mm -hmm. there might be one really small, you know, like John Smith is down the road and mm -hmm. he's got X number of trees, but it's not enough. So these companies started going in to centralize the fermentation so that mm. the farmers, so in any That's given cool. bag of chocolate that I'm, or cacao beans, excuse me, that I'm roasting, yeah. there might be beans from a hundred different farms. Mm. So it's very important that they get, um, consistent farming practices yeah. across the board so that we've got consistent cacao coming to us to make good chocolate. Yeah. The companies that are importing the chocolate are then paying these farmers five to 10 or sometimes more than they would get for like the farm gate or the, mm -hmm. the futures price. Yeah. So we're trying to create a more sustainable yeah. operation for these farmers where they can grow more, they can get more money. Yeah. Maybe some of their kids will change their mind and want to come back and take over the farms <laughs> and keep this going. Cause that's been a big problem. Oh yeah. Recently is they just, the kids see the struggle their parents have had. They're like, forget it. I'm going to the city. <laughs> Um, hmm. so, so, wow. Yeah. So, so to, they group the farmers so that yeah. there isn't one man left out unless he's not growing good cacao. Mm -hmm. And then hmm. hopefully all of their cacao ends up being purchased. Yeah. And so it reminds me, there's so many things that uh, like, I'm thinking of like old school farmers who like a town, a village might have like one grain mill, you know, and they would all bring the, you know, their their uh, crop, whatever they they want to be milled at this one place, you know. There's still one in Pen. Uh, is it in Penyan? Penyan has a uh, is home to this family, um, Klaus uh, and Mary Hal uh, Klaus Martins, and Klaus is uh, like world renowned for his organic. Well, not necessarily organic, but organic farming, mm -hmm. like real farming, um, and. I believe in Pinyan, they still have this old school stone mill, you know, it's like in a, you know, in its own house sort of a thing. Yeah. And farmers can still bring their grain or whatever it is to be uh, milled there in this one place. And that's kind of what that reminds me of is all these farmers bringing their stuff together yeah. to be fermented. Yeah, it's very similar. We were in um, Sicily a year ago, October, and we took a tour of this olive oil mm -hmm. um, processing facility. Okay. Um, and we were there on the day when all of the locals, so on Fridays, this company lets the locals bring in their huge bins of olives from their trees wow. and get them processed. So yeah, hmm. so it's very similar. Yeah. And, you know, and, that, and I think for the sustainability of most of what we do these days, mm -hmm. having that ability is, you know, having a, the centralization where, you know, you, you can do that for a lot of products is going to be key going forward. I oh, think. yeah, for sure. Is it possible for uh, a large city or, you know, our culture today, uh, especially in most places in America, to 
really have that local sustainability like we're talking about? I think it absolutely is. And I, hmm. I, you know, I think especially in our area, because you look at all of the farming that we have hmm. and all of the land that we have and all of the, you know, pasture land. And, and I think it for sure is you, there's, um, my friend Chad who owns the bine yard out in Casanova. Hmm. He's a hop processor. He okay. grows his own, but yeah. he also has a huge machine that was brought from Germany, I think. Hmm. And so he allows other hop farmers in the area to come and he'll process their hops for him. Oh, so cool. a situation like that, yeah. you know, so, and then you look at a place like Nelson farms and in yeah. Nelson that people who have jams or jellies or mm. maybe want to can cold brew coffee or whatever it might yeah. be, that's a possibility for them to mm. go to a place like that to then get their product out. Mm. So I think, I think it absolutely is. And I think very slowly we're maybe returning to that in okay. some instances. Yeah. And I think we could in more instances, people just need the actual, feet on the ground, the makers, the, they need to start to come together and say, okay, if we're all going to make a business of this, mm -hmm. we need to have one central butcher or we need to have one yeah. central canning facility or, you know, my, you know, and, and with all of the CSAs we have, yeah, you know, with their extra crops, mm -hmm. like they could all get together yeah, and, you know, whenever there's an excess or They've got extra stuff or, you know, they just call the other CSA and say, Hey, hmm. here's my thought. Can we, let's yeah. do this. And then we partner on it and yeah. then it, we split the bill and we split the profits. But <laughs> so, yeah, I, 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 I absolutely think it is. I, I don't think there's, there's a lot of instances in our lives right now where we don't need to be purchasing the products that are coming from other countries yeah. or across the country. Right. We might need to eat a little more seasonally. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I've got to be one of the biggest raspberry eaters in the whole area. <laughs> and when it's raspberry season here, it, I'm in heaven. Yeah. But I like to eat them year round. So they come from France, I think, or Denmark. I'm not even sure oh, where. Really? I'm not even sure if you look on the, I, would never. I think so, the Wegmans yeah. case. I'm, I'm, but, <laughs> you know, but they're coming from far away. Yeah. Um, bananas. I love bananas. Right. We're not ever going to grow bananas no. here. So. Obviously, it mm. can't happen, but uh, there are a lot of instances where we could start to mm. pay a little more attention to that. And, yeah. Um, and I'm not even talking about the the pollution aspect of it. Right. I'm just talking about supporting yeah. the local right. community and the number of farmers markets we have. Yes. Yeah, it really is. I don't get down to the regional market nearly enough, and obviously, that's kind of like one of the bigger ones, but... Um, there's so many other smaller ones and I don't get down there nearly enough. And whenever I go down there, I'm just like, wow, this is absolutely amazing. Yeah. You know, you forget that all of this is here. Right. Um, and people are coming from all over the place to come and sell whatever it is that they've yeah. raised or grown or made at the regional market. It's, it's really special. Yeah. I mean, on a Saturday you could wake up, head out to Casanova, stop at the Casanova yeah. Farmer's Markets, get your breakfast, and then go on to Hamilton. Hmm. Hamilton has an amazing farmer's market. Yeah. And then if you wanted, you could even go on and head out to Utica. Yeah. And Utica's farmer's market is exceptional as well. And you're hmm. going to find different vendors yeah. at every single one. Right. And they're always, I mean, they're, their produce, that's been one of the things I've loved most about selling the chocolate at farmer's markets is meeting the people that are there. Yeah. Um, I've made some friends through it. Mm -hmm. But their produce is outstanding yeah yeah it uh, really is. you know they care oh it's finding somebody yeah. who truly it's inspirational cares about it. yeah without yeah. a doubt it's i i um i think kind of the key to all of this you know like you talking about um you know maybe they convince their kids the, you know the kids and you know who are their parents of these farms um and the kids don't want to go through that struggle mm -hmm. you know i mean who does Right. I mean, you know, my father was has been in the restaurant industry his entire life, and to see it as a cook or an owner, I never <laughs> want to go through. <laughs> never, yeah. ever, ever, ever. I would love to own a restaurant, but when I think of like what I would open or how it, you know anything right. like that, I always think of how small it would have to be to minimize your, you know, 
16 hour days when you're there and you know yeah well everybody that. says like i make the cho- i make the chocolate above exo taco mm. you know chris and i joke um and he loves all of his employees but we just joke he's like don't like you get your first employee yeah and then like it's all it's a transformative situation mm. like everything changes at yeah. that point and then you know running operations like he does where it's you yeah. know you've got x number of employees at this number of restaurants and so you've really got to know yeah and you obviously can't run a restaurant successfully i think just on your own you can't right. cook and be the host and waiter and bartender right. it's not possible yeah you know on the outside it seems like such a to me i'm like oh man that would be so great i love talking to people and this and that yeah. but then it's like you you meet people that are actually doing it and i just have so much gratitude yeah like every time i eat one of his tacos or you know yeah. have a pizza at a pizza regional i'm just right. like I'm so grateful for what you guys do and the amount yeah. of attention and the high expectations that you hold all of your people to mm-hmm. for the whole experience. Right. So you teach a yoga class, right? Yep. Yep. And uh, so I feel like this would be a great question to ask you because yeah. it's about balance. Okay. <laughs> but talking about this, you know, um, the business, our the Eat Local CNY has three uh, employees that are side hustlers. And yep. so... They are people who have full time jobs and they, you know, work a few hours a month uh, for us, but um, take a huge load off of my shoulders um, because now I don't have to spend as much time up. And we hired a uh, post scheduler for all of our clients. Mm -hmm. And uh, my wife has thoroughly enjoyed that because now Sundays have gone from me sitting on the couch scheduling out the post for the whole week to not knowing what to do with myself, you know? So there's things like that that are absolutely amazing about having it. But in light of everything that's happening right now, being a social media director for five restaurants, that's also a side hustle of sorts, you know, in that relationship I have with them, I'm getting texts right now that they're saying nobody was in last night. Yeah. So I'm kind of plan, you know, planning for, um, uh, those relationships to end if things don't get better. Yeah. I have to talk about, you know, everything that's going on. Uh, cause this will come out and this episode will come out in two weeks and hopefully everything's uh, would be nice. back to normal yep. by then. But having said that, um, I may have to let these people go for a time because if clients drop me, I'll have to, you know, there won't be the money. Right. Um, which then brings me back to a place of, everything time and you know all that kind of stuff just spending all of my time and effort free time working on the business again Mm -hmm. so the question is this even when you're trying to build something how do you do that and still have balance because i feel like you know like chris with you know his restaurants that are wildly successful Mm -hmm. it feels like it has to become if you're going to do that it has to become your everything your entire, all of your waking hours and attention and everything has to go to that. So how do you balance those things? Well, I think it, one, I think if you're passionate about it, um, it becomes less of a chore and more of a, like I'm up, I'm excited. And even though I'm going to have to face this HR issue and this delivery not coming in and yeah, I think you, that just falls in line with what your, what your goals are, mm-hmm. first of all. Okay. So for me, I went from complete freedom of my schedule, mm-hmm. being on straight commission, you know, coming and going from my last job at Common Fund as, as I pleased. Yeah. So I could go to the chocolate shop and I could do the work I needed to do and go yeah. back to work and, you know, to now being 8.30 to 5.30, which yeah. I haven't been since my first job out of college. <laughs> so it's been 16 years since I... Wow you know, 17 years probably since I Hmm. had a fixed schedule. So it's been a big change for me. So I really needed to, and this is where the, you know, your yoga part of the question (laughs) came in. I, I really looked, turned to that and said, Hmm. you just can't put pressure on it. Okay. You just can't force yourself to do these things. You can't force yourself for things to change. So my stepson, Caden, thank goodness, has been a godsend, mm-hmm. and he's been coming to the shop with me on Saturdays and Sundays. Oh, that's cool. I let him do the roasting. Mm-hmm. I showed him how to do it. He does the roasting, so I can tend to other things while we're there. So we go that's for cool. maybe four hours. Today, we're going to be there a little longer, and tomorrow we're going to go because we're tied up with stuff next weekend, which we can talk about. But um, yeah. 
So I just said to myself, you're, you're, you're only able to do what you can do. Yeah. I also like to work out. I have to go to work. I like to work the dog. I like to walk the dog. <laughs> I like to be with my wife, you know, so you've got to just figure out what your limits are. Okay. And hmm. you know, I think the, for the restaurant part of it, you'd like to think that there's going to be some level of, let me back up. I think people just need to take a deep breath. Yeah. In yoga, we do a lot of breathing. <laughs> and I think, you know, last night I came home from work and I was frustrated and, you know, just annoyed because there was going to be a change in my day to day going into next week. But mm -hmm. I, Woke up this morning and I just kind of looked around and I said, okay, look at all these things that we do have to be grateful for. Hmm. And I have, you know, I'm lucky that I do have my primary job. So that is available to me. Yeah. But I, you know, I, I can't imagine what, you know, restaurants and coffee shops are going through, but I think they yeah. just need to stay the course. Just keep like, there was a chat going on amongst yoga teachers last night mm -hmm. about what do we teach and how do we reach out? And I, you know, my point was mm -hmm. just, and my wife's point was you just need to keep doing what you're doing and doing yeah. it well. Right. I go into the chocolate shop and I get done what I can. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to race through it because it's not going to be good quality. Right. So as long as you stay the course. And you keep, this isn't going to be a forever thing. We mm. just need to buckle down. Yeah. We all need to support each other. People mm. that aren't in the food industry need to get out, get fresh air. Yeah. You don't need to be a shut in. So right. get to your <laughs> local coffee shop. Yeah. Get to your local restaurant, support the people mm. in your community who are there support. And I'm, this goes beyond just restaurants. Right. You know, and I would say to the people that are concerned about it, the, the marketing thing, any marketer will tell you the last time you want to cut back on any marketing, mm. especially something relatively inexpensive like social media, yeah. <laughs> is when things are going downhill. Oh, yeah. If anything, sure. you want to double up yeah. and figure out other ways. Hit the ground. Like, right. reach out to people. Do something out of the box. Yeah. You know? Um, so, I, you know, it's a very scary time. I know that for fitness places, it's mm. a scary time for them because people are concerned. Yeah. And, Maybe there is a maybe there is a reason to be concerned and maybe there isn't. Right. So you need to decide are you going to go on about your normal life and just and that's kind of my attitude. Be careful. I'm yeah. careful every day. I right. wash my hands. I'm <laughs> you know. Yeah. I, my wife is a dietitian and um and and I've a uh, brother a brother who's in um uh high level federal government and talking with him who he's kind of a always prepared type of a person, you know, <laughs> he's not like, um, um, he doesn't have like the food store buckets, like, in, yeah. you know, when nothing's happening, yeah. he's, not he's, that. Re he's ready to go. He, yeah. He's ready. Go awry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So he and I were having a conversation the other day on the phone and Rebecca was in the car and, you know, I, we got off the phone and she was just like, can you stop please? You know? <laughs> and, and I don't, you know, it, it really is. It's, it is putting things in balance with how you're responding to this stuff because it's, it, there's no point in being terrified or panicking about, um, COVD itself. Yeah. You know, it's, um, it's knowing kind of your surroundings. It's knowing how, you know, others are kind of reacting and things like sure. that and being able to keep, uh, I think a distance with that and not kind of and by keep a distance. I mean, don't jump into kind of the, you know, everyone else's panic along with it. Yeah. You know, and I understand why people are there's, you know, it's, uh, just because I'm not, doesn't mean I can't see why people are, but right. You know, like my yoga teacher said, and I would say this to everybody, like this thing that's going on right now is not you. It's not who you are. Right. So who you are is something that's not, is unchanging. Yeah. So look inside yourself. Yeah. Take a closer look at that. Worry less about everything that's going on around you. Yeah. And just support the people that are there. Support your restaurant, support your coffee shop, support your, the retail stores, you yeah. know, don't, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah, we got to keep moving forward. I have a feeling that it's, uh, when, whatever all of this ends, it, there's going to be a lot of people that kind of, uh, are changed from it and in a better way yeah. that are, I mean, myself last night, I logged off Facebook for the first time yeah. in years yeah. and I do it for a living, but I still, I logged off of, you know, and yeah. I mean, even saying that seems a little silly because it's a social networking app, but I still logged off of it and it was just like, this is doing no, you know, nobody. No, any good. we're just at a point now where it's, yeah, it's just, it's repetitious and yeah, not helping. So, yeah. 
So, you know, one thing that kind of uh, I think is in kind of encompassed in what we've just been talking about, and that is um, it's a little different for me. Like I do have a goal one day of, um, uh, well, my, my family grew up always vacationing in Skinny Atlas. Mm-hmm. And so even when I was younger and we lived in Kentucky, uh, my dad being from here, all of our vacations were to Skinny Atlas. Mm. Um, we never went to Disney or anything like that. It was always Skinny Atlas for a week or two. And uh, at times, my you know our family has had places out there, but even today, we all rent a house in Skinny Atlas and go out there for a week every year. And so one of my goals is to one day have a nice house that is on Skinny Atlas yeah. Lake, right? So there is something like that where that's going to require money and you know mm. I'm really going to have to kind of make the business work. Um, aside from someone who has a goal or a dream like that, um, someone who just wants to work at a business, like I think like going back to the farmers and, you know, Costa Rica, Mm -hmm. wherever it is where their kids are going to the city, uh, they don't want to deal with the struggle. I can't imagine that the, um, that their parents, the, you know, people that are growing, uh, cacao, that they're probably getting rich from it. Right. And so. In my head, I think, well, I could do something like that, you know, kind of have, I probably couldn't grow cacao. I don't think I would yeah. be good at it or necessarily specifically that, yeah. right? But something like that, as long as I understood that that is the dream, you know, like in other words, nobody's going to get rich. Nobody's going to become a millionaire, I doubt growing cacao unless you're like or you making know. chocolate for that matter right but. <laughs> exactly right but it's a passion yeah and so i feel like you know there are things out there where it's like just follow your passions and everything will come to you but that's not necessarily no. true no right? no and i wouldn't yeah <laughs> no and i wouldn't ever tell anybody that that is the case uh, you know i think sometimes people fall in and get lucky and yeah. maybe it does happen but you know for when i when I started the chocolate business, as I was formulating the idea, two of the people I met with, one was Chris Biley and the other one was Paul Messina from the yeah. Pizza Regional. And I took the idea in front of both of them and I said, hey, here's something I'm like thinking about doing. And and they were both super ecstatic. Like hmm. Chris was like, this is such a rad idea. I've never heard of anything about it. That's cool. And Paul was like, I mean, this this is something that Syracuse is probably just getting primed for. Yeah. And I think the community could really get behind it. And I, it would be a huge asset to, you know, what we can do. Yeah. Uh, you know, so mm-hmm. hearing that from those two people fueled me, but I knew realistically one, I, f- I didn't want to take on debt to grow the bill, the yeah. business. So, you know, we've, we've paid for everything that we've done and now the business, you know, it supports itself. I'm not That's making money off of it. Right. It supports itself and it gives me something to do. And, yeah. um, so I think people need to make the decision. So if you're going to follow your passion for me, I, I'm just letting the business grow organically mm-hmm. and I don't do a lot of marketing. I, you know, I'm on Instagram and Facebook, but I don't have the time to really keep up with that. I don't pay anybody to do it. Yeah. Could I do more through that? Yeah. But I've actually, my thought going into it was I wanted to own this market. So yeah. I wanted, I wanted to really start in Syracuse mm-hmm. and then slowly start to expand from there. And maybe that's Utica, Rochester, you know, going south. I don't know, mm. but I wanted to start to do that. And so mm. as time has gone by and as I've gotten better at what I do, I started at the farmer's markets Yeah, and then we did about two or so months at the farmer's market. And then I got my e-commerce site up Okay, and then from the e-commerce site, then, um, I started to reach out to some people that might want to wholesale the, the bars. Mm. So I have a handful of stores around town That's that cool. wholesale 20 East and Casanova, um, Epicus and downtown salt city coffee roasters. Yeah. There's been a few other places that have in from time to time. And, um, you know, mm. every so often I'll get a call. I've been out for a while. Can I reorder? Yeah. And then what I started to do was I reached out, um, well, it's happened with Jared up at, um, St. Urban mm. first, but I was also at the same time making some test batches for Paul Messina at a pizza. So okay. in his Budino, mm-hmm. he uses our Dominican Re- Republic chocolate. Oh, nice. 
And so I wanted to make sure that I had my process down and a little better understanding of how the chocolate works and how the cocoa butter factors in when you're baking Mm. and things like that. So, you know, I've just found different avenues that I can play around with in order to kind of extend the business reach Mm -hmm. outside of just trying to sell bars. Yeah. And so little Mm. by little, I'm just trying to take on what I can um, and work with the right people. So you know, what Jared does, he changes his dessert every single week and it always yeah. involves chocolate. And uh, yeah. so, you know, mm. we, we've been up there when it's been in ice cream, it's been in cakes, it's been a covering to a cake. It's yeah. been, I mean, I've been up there so many times and what he does with it yeah. is unbelievable. And yeah. the work that I did with Paul to try to figure out for their specific purpose, yeah. how we needed to change it. And then when mm. it was, I got the call from Paul and he said, don't do anything else. You've nailed it. And I came in and I tried it versus what they were using. And even it was for me, the best part was seeing his eyes light up. Yeah. You know, cause you don't want to like fail somebody who you look up to <laughs> right, and respect. Yeah. So, you know, having those situations and the people that do use the chocolate outside of just, I mean, it's an honor to me whenever somebody buys a bar. Yeah. I had a woman who she was out at the demonstration kitchen at the Inns at Aurora oh, yeah. or Inns of Aurora and Grace who runs that she contacted me m- months ago maybe even a year ago and she said I just found out about you I want to start using your chocolate mm. in for our chocolate tastings That's cool. and so I got an order from a woman last week um, and she said I I tried it when I was at the Inns of Aurora mm. and I love your chocolate and so experiences like that yeah. are what make me want to do this yeah. it's something that lights people's eyes up they love talking about it yeah and so would i like to see it make a little more money of course (laughs) but realistically with my time constraints and all the other things i like to do it may not be a feasible thing so i think long story back to your question people need to figure out what is your goal for this Mm -hmm. and does rapid growth and inundating the market or multiple markets yeah Does that serve your business or, you know, listening to your guests from um, this week's episode from the, what was the brewery? Uh, Full bore. Full bore. Yeah. You're listening to the way that they talked about it where they, you know, they both worked in banking and then they met each other and then it was, okay, let's, they went and did some smoking and they were, one of them was home brewing and then, you know, Mm. that's, yeah. They, you know, you, you sort of dip your toe in. So you just need to figure out. And I think you've, in your specific case, You've got your hands in enough different places yeah. and it, I think you just, it's one of those things you can't rush. Exactly. I was just going to say that when like, if you had started, um, and we're trying to be, you know, in every Wegmans or every right. AMP or whatever, and within a year's time, like you said, you can't go in and rush the process when you're making it right. because something's going to go wrong. It's could not I, could be I be good. making more money? Probably. Right. And would I'm, I be making an inferior product? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No question about it because I would have no understanding of how each individual origin of chocolate mm-hmm. works and what the real flavor profiles right. are. and what It's just like when a coffee roaster starts to roast a new batch of coffee. Right. Like, could they roast it exactly the same as what, how everything else is being done and keep the process exactly the same? Sure. And yeah. they could get a bag of coffee onto the shelf within two days. Right. But that's not. Yeah. I think that's the key for local. Um, well, for the, just the local community is to have people like yourself who it's, yes, it's going to grow and you have a goal to hit different markets, but it's also a passion project. It's taking yeah. the time and putting that love into something and doing it very well. Yeah. You I know? mean, we're in a place where there's nobody else. There's one chocolate maker outside of Buffalo in Lancaster, New York. And then there's fruition chocolate down in the Hudson Valley. And then there's one in Albany too. Um, I forget who it was. They were at um, the taste of New York or best of New York, whatever it's called this past year. And they were from downstate somewhere. Um, I can't think of the name of them. So there's Anyways, a few. Yeah. There's a few around. So I could have come in here and said, "Okay, I'm going to take a business loan." And I'm, nobody else is doing this. So right. obviously, like, there's an opening. Yeah. 
but just because nobody else is doing it doesn't mean that you should be putting out a product. So right. I think <laughs> I think the focus always needs to be whether it's you know the social media work you're doing or the stuff at Gerhardt's or wherever. Yeah, the focus always has to be on, and I think Chris said this to me. He's like, get your product down, mm-hmm. like make an amazing product, mm-hmm. and then worry about brand, and then worry about this, and then worry about that. Yeah, you know the t-shirts come way down the line. Right. Yeah. So you know. <laughs> Get your product down. Get your process in place and hmm. make that, like, do that. Like, don't just rush to open a restaurant right. because you've got access to the best grass-fed steak that there ever is. Like, figure out what all of that's going to mean and what does it mean to the client. Like, I try to tell a story with the chocolate. And mm-hmm. so when people are buying the chocolate from me, I want them to buy into – like where the cacao comes from and yeah. the story and understand why you're paying either nine or $11 for a bar of chocolate. Cause yeah. that's unheard of. And pe- right. when people hear that and there are a fair number of people that just roll their eyes and walk away and I get it. <laughs> it's fine. I'm not offended, but there are also a lot of people hmm. that totally understand it yeah. and maybe they can only afford to buy one bar. Yeah. And that's to me, if they go home and they buy that bar, and then I see them at the next farmer's market, and they're like, hey, we're here because we saw you were going to be here. Yeah. And I have some regular customers, and <laughs> it's always an honor for me to have them come back and buy another bar of chocolate. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that really is amazing. Um, it rem- your, your story and doing this and working with, like, you know, and talking about the local farmers um, from where you're sourcing, it reminds me of a family who he the – the dad was a missionary of all things in Thailand. Mm -hmm. And when he was there, realized that there were these small local coffee farmers that were just had nothing to really be able to sell um, to like the mass federation and not even like they were only producing 500 bags, you know, I mean, they were producing like a bag, you know? Um, And he wound up um, starting this coffee company where basically uh, he would take as many as much of the coffee that they could produce and take it to a facility. And granted, it's not specialty coffee. It's, you know, it is like ground and, you know, mm-hmm. pre-ground and pre packaged small packages, all that kind of stuff. But now what he does is when it's um, off season is he takes all of these coffee beans, get the, gets them ground and packaged and then travels the country. He's still in the church community. Yeah. And so he'll go and instead of getting up in the pulpit and talking about whatever, he gets up and talks about all of these farmers that are, you know, that they've been able to yeah. like support their families. And now, you know, new families that were, you know, maybe struggling, you know, financially for whatever reason now are able to have this life providing yeah. for the family, growing coffee that they then sell to him. And he now travels churches talking about it and then selling coffee uh, to the churchgoers at whatever church he's at. And this is now this crazy cycle. And yeah. every year they're, you know, bringing new farmers into the mix. Well, it's a huge ripple effect, too. I, I don't think um, we ever think enough about the effect that our purchases mm. have on like the world around us yeah, and, you know, taking the time, you know, for those people that are chocolate lovers to seek out what I'm not saying just for me, there's probably 300 or more bean to bar makers across the, uh, just our country. Mm. Um, that not only helps the community where the it's made to a certain extent, but it also, if you buy the right chocolate, it's helping, our whole world because yeah. you're, it, that money is going back to farmers who are trying to do stuff in an ecologically positive way yeah. and do it in a sustainable way. And those tropical areas around our, around our world that are just getting destroyed are some of the most important that we have as far as the future goes. Yeah. And so making it so these farmers can afford to keep their land and they're not selling out to the, the, pineapple farms and these large plantations and don't get me wrong i love pineapple (laughs) but um you know it's we've got to hang on to some of that stuff and you hear about all this stuff that's been going on down in the amazon rainforest and like our decisions yeah impact those areas and trying to cut down on the plastics that we use and finding products that have 
more recyclable aspects to it or more reusable aspects to it. Yeah. It all makes such a big difference. Yeah. Without a doubt. Well, Tyler, thank you so much for coming down today. I really appreciate it. You know, coming down on a Saturday. Yeah. I've been a big fan. I'm, yeah, it's an honor to be here and keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah.